Well, hey, what's going on there? Happy Easter. Happy Easter weekend, Easter Sunday. Hope you're doing good. I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic, actually, because I got something to share with you. We are talking about the resurrection, but I guarantee it is not in a way that you have ever heard before. Be honest with you, it's not in a way that I have ever heard before because the text that I wanted to study and the text that God ended up showing me are two completely different things and it paints a picture of Jesus that I believe I need to see, I know you need to see, we all need to see this and it's gonna be an absolutely awesome time. So go ahead, close your eyes, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for what it is that we get to talk about. I thank you so much for this message. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and everything, everything that he has done, but not just has done. What he has done is making a way for what he is doing and ultimately what he will continue to do when he returns. I pray that we see Jesus Christ the way that you, that's the way that, that, that you have glorified him. That's how I pray that we see him. Not as this feeble, weak, passive option, but as the absolute Lord of our life. He is Lord. He is nothing else other than Lord, which is why we call Him Savior. So again, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Please speak through me now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You know that phrase, I ever tell you I don't like Pastor Cole? I ever tell you I don't like that that phrase? I, just that I don't like the way that it looks. Even with why I throw the lower third, Pastor Coleman Hunter. I like, I don't know, but I don't like when people call me Coleman. You know, if you, you call me Cole, I just don't like the way. I'm still getting used to the phrase Pastor Cole, because uh, for the longest time I was not Pastor Cole. I was Officer Hunter. Officer Hunter. That was my name. That was my title. Uh, for 13 years I was a police officer, uh, and I have been with multiple, multiple. Uh, I don't want to say multiple agencies, I've only been a part of three, but I've seen all aspects of law enforcement. Um, I, my original beat was actually just north of here, about a couple blocks off of Speedway. Uh, I was with Tucson PD for five years, I was with Marana PD for five years, and I was with an agency in North Carolina uh, for just under three years. And so I, I have spent time in law enforcement on the West Coast. I have been on the East Coast. I have, um, I have seen it as a big agency, small agency. I have seen all types of, of police calls. That, that you, you name it. You name the call. I, there's a good chance I have seen it in some way, shape, or form. And my number one job, everybody says all, all these jobs. You know what my number one job was as a police officer? Let's keep the peace. That is what I was. Now, I'm not there to make arrests. I'm not there to, to fix. To, I, my job was to keep the peace. S however I could figure that out, whatever, whatever I could do, my job in a nutshell was someone's peace was disrupted and my job was to come up or identify a solution to make sure that people were at peace. Most of the time, that's doable. Most of the time, even driving, you could figure out what was going on and you had a pretty good idea of what you were going to be doing, what solution you were going to be enacting. But, dude, every once in a while, every once in a while, there was a call that would come my way that I'm sitting here going, <laughs> I don't know what to do about this one. I remember one time, I am, I am, I am meeting with an officer and we get dispatched to a call. So him and I are driving. And as we are driving, we are headed southeast. And the direction we were headed was toward, uh, uh, to me it was UMC, but now it's, it's, a, it's Banner. Uh, it's a hospital. And we're heading there and they have a helipad. And there was, something caught my attention. It was the helicopter in the sky, but it just, it didn't sound right. It didn't look right. And it's flying low. And I'm sitting here driving down the road and out my windshield, I see this helicopter falling out of the sky and it crashes and of course people are calling 911 you know we're over the you, you, and I, I can see it and I said hey you know I gave my designator and I said I'll be in route I, I have I have a visual on it I'll, I'll be in route and I said I'll be in route over the radio over the air but in my brain <laughs> I'm thinking I don't know what I'm gonna do when I get there I, I mean dude 
You ever, you ever had your heart beat so much that you actually become aware of where it is in your chest? You become, I mean, that, that's, I'm sitting here driving to this thing and I'm like, I, I've never seen this before. I couldn't, I, I'm, I'm, I had to read the, the, the I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do and I'm trying to figure out where officers are and I mean, the, um, I don't want to call the lack of blood flow, the increased blood flow, I don't know what it was, but I couldn't, I couldn't make a rational thought. I couldn't, I couldn't get my, I couldn't get my breath. I couldn't get my wits about me. And, but, and while all of that was tough, while, while trying to compartmentalize and trying to engage, I couldn't turn my brain on. And, and, and while doing all of that, the most difficult part of this entire thing was the uncontrollable thoughts that were coming into my head. One thought after another, it was just, what do I do? What do I, you know, do I, do I ask? Do I, do I not ask? Does anybody else know what to do? What am I going to encounter when I get there? Um, do I have enough units? Who's going to control? I mean, I just, the one after, and they may have been connected to one another. The thoughts may not have been connected to one another. I mean, and I don't like feeling like this. I'm trained not to feel this way. I'm a police officer. We run into every, in the situation where everybody's running away from, and they taught us how to keep ourselves calm. They taught us combat breathing. They taught us how to prepare for situations. They taught us how when the situation around us is getting out of control and we're starting to lose hope, lose faith, we're starting to lose our footing in the situation around us, I was taught how to stay calm in the most hectic of situations. And so sitting here looking at this, I'm frustrated because I, I can't get a grip on myself. It's the racing mind that was driving me nuts. It's, and it's the racing mind that'll drive you nuts. It's all of these thoughts that just involuntarily get dug up that we almost feel like we're out of control. We feel like our brain isn't ours. They're, they're one thought after the other. And what I'm trying to paint is that when we all get into this state, this feeling of anxiety inside, it steals our peace. It robs us of our joy. The peace within us, the peace around us, it is disturbed. And that's the thing that I learned as a police officer, trying to see my job from the side of somebody calling 911. People aren't calling 911 to have a conversation with the police department. They're calling 911 because at some point in their life, their peace was disturbed. Something going on around them or within them has robbed them of their joy. And it gets worse. It gets worse. It's bad enough if it's a perfect stranger walking by. I mean, nobody wants to see anybody harmed. And I think any human being, any self-respecting human being, if they saw someone harm, they would want to call 911 and, and, and help, but it gets 15 to 20 times worse when the person that you're calling 911 on behalf of is someone that you love, somebody that cares about. And dude, it's even harder when it's you. When you're calling 911 on your behalf, it's hard to be at peace because the peace within you and around you has been disturbed and it's hard to stay calm. It's difficult to stay calm. And it doesn't take much to disrupt the peace around us. It's very, very simple. Very simple. Very easily. We're all very easily disruptable. But not everybody calls 911. Some people do. Who do you call? Who do you call? When the peace within you, the peace around you, when it gets disrupted, when it gets disturbed, when things around you get completely haywire and out of control, who do you call? Who do you reach out to? Is it a family friend? Is it, a, is it an old habit? Is it an old place? Who do you reach out to? Where do you go when your peace is disrupted? Some people do call 911. But whether it's 911, everybody has something or someone that they reach out to. But maybe you don't call 911. Maybe you don't. And if you don't call 911, then you and Jesus have something in common. And the thing that you have in common with Jesus is the title of this sermon. <clears throat> because as I was preparing for Easter, one of the things that I was shown, I'll go ahead and write this down as the title, is when the peace within or the peace around gets disturbed, Jesus doesn't call 911. He doesn't call 911. 
And I'll show you why, and it's going to be out of John chapter 18. But before I, I show you why Jesus doesn't call 911, I have to, I have to give you some insight as to how this sermon came about. Because I wasn't going to go to John 18. I was studying the last week, of, really the last day or the last hours of Jesus' earthly ministry of his, of, his, of, his, of his life. I was studying that. And I didn't mean to do this. I don't like when this happens, but I got four different accounts. This is one of 14 different stories that is covered in all of the Gospels. And I hate when this happens. I mean, that's a strong word, but it's true. I don't like to look at life through the lens of my former employment. I don't like to look at, at sermons through the lens of being a police officer, but man, this week it just took over. I couldn't help it. I had four different accounts of this, four different accounts of this occurrence, and I'm sitting here and I'm just going, like the investigation is coming over. And I had somebody tell me one time, when it happens, just give into it. Stop trying to fight it. There's, there's something within you that God is trying to access, that God is trying to get to. Just let him have it. And so I decided to steer into it. And this sermon prep was a little bit different because this one was not the typical process I go to. This sermon was more like a homicide investigation for me. And so I decided to steer with it. I, I, I scrapped everything I was writing. I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to investigate. I'm going to investigate scripture. I'm going to investigate what happened to Jesus the same way that I would investigate a homicide. And when you, when you go to a homicide, the first thing you do is you seal your crime scene. You go big too. The crime scene happened here. Then I'm taking the whole thing. If, 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 if there was a crime scene that happened right here where I'm standing, I would take the entire mall from Campbell to Park which is that street way down there to that one on the other side of Old Main. I would take it. Why? Why would I do that? Well, number one is I don't know what bits of evidence I'm going to come across. And number two, and this is a cop joke, the media. Media can't cross where you put the tape. So where do you put the tape? As far away as you can so the media can't see what's going on because it's a pain in the butt. Just kidding. Media is great. They just have a job to do. And, uh, but I, you go big. You go big with your crime scene. So I went huge. I'm sitting here going, I'm going to secure my scene. I'm going to figure out what the heck happened. After you secure your scene, the next thing that you got to do is you got to get a whiteboard out. You got to figure out where is everybody or where was everybody? Who saw it? Who was involved? And where were they? You have to get that out and you have to orchestrate that. And I've got two whiteboards in my office. And so that's what I did. I got my markers out, I got my different colors out. Uh, we used to do this in the back of, uh, of cop cars. To be honest with you, you just get some of those markers and you could turn the, your trunk into a whiteboard and that's how we, we drew it out so that we could see what was going on. And I started drawing out who are my players, who are my witnesses. And here's the cool thing about this investigation. This, is, this happened 2,000 years ago. And the witness statements from that day, or that evening I should say, are still preserved in scripture today. I've got four very, very pristine key witness statements from witnesses you are all very familiar with. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've got four of them. And so I started looking at, 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 the, at the commonalities in their statements and the differences in their statements. I started looking at who they were, how they wrote, what they were trying to get me to see. And so the first thing I looked at is the commonalities. The commonalities. And all four of them, all of them, all four statements told me that this whole incident started at a house in Jerusalem. They didn't tell me which house. I don't know where it was, but it just says a house. But this all, the universal statement is they said, and they, they all said something specific. Three specific words. Universal. I, I, I underline all these in my Bible. All of them. All four of them. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. They said, when evening came. When evening came. That's important to miss. That's important. If you don't see it, you're going to miss it. And what I'm going to try to do is explain to you how they kept time back in the New Testament, back in, back in New Testament times, back in Jesus' time. That is, a, that is an expressive statement when evening came. That's giving me a snapshot. That's giving me a start time. Because we keep night, how do we talk about night? We talk about it in hours. That's how we explain night. But back then, 
They didn't talk about it in hours. They talked about it in a phrase called watches. Watches. There was four watches that the night, the evening time was broken up into. You had the first watch, evening, the first watch, and that was between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. You had night, the second watch, that was between 9 p.m. and midnight. You had when the rooster crows, the third watch, that was between midnight and 3 p.m., or 3 a.m., I'm sorry. And then you had the fourth watch, dawn, which was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Four different watches, each broke up into three-hour increments that span the 12-hour evening. And the reason I'm pointing this out and the reason you have to see this is because all four Gospels, all four witnesses tell me two things. Number, two things happened inside that house. Two things. Number one, there were 13 people there that we know of. There may have been more, but there were certainly 13 people there. Jesus and his 12 disciples. The first thing that all four accounts tell me is that one of the disciples left. His name was Judas. He left the house. Okay? But the second thing, the second thing, the second thing that all four Gospels tell me is that Jesus tells Judas, I'm sorry, that Jesus tells Peter after Judas, Judas leaves, Jesus tells Peter that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Okay, now I gave you all that information to give you a window. This whole evening started when? When evening came. So that's 6 p.m. That's the beginning of my window. And it said before the rooster crows, that's before the beginning of the third watch. Well, the third watch is midnight to 3 a.m. So what this text, what all four of these witnesses tell me is they've given me a six hour time frame. I have my crime scene, I have my players, and I have my window of time, my window of opportunity between 6 p.m. and midnight. That is the window that this whole event took place in. And so the thing I've got to discover inside of this six hour window is where is everybody? Where is everybody? Well, we already talked about it. One person's MIA. Judas, he's MIA. But all four Gospels, Gospels tell me that Jesus and the other 11, possibly others, they, after evening comes, after they have dinner, they leave the house and they go to this place that's adjacent to the town, to the city, Jerusalem. They go to the Mount of Olives. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's adjacent to the city. All four witnesses tell me that. But Matthew and Mark give me specific details. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, if you read what he says, he, they, both of them tell me the group split up. Both of them say that. The whole group says, who, uh, both, both gospels tell me the group split up. Matthew 26, 36 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go there. Okay, that's important. Judas, gone. Now we know that this group splits. You sit here while Jesus says, I'm going there. Okay, so Judas is gone. Group here, group splits. Jesus goes over here. But Mark tells me who Jesus took from the group with him over here. You stay here, I'll go there. And he tells three people to come with him. And Mark tells me who those are. Mark 14, says from the group, says he took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed. So let's zoom out. Let's zoom out. Judas, gone. The group that was told to stay here, and Jesus went here, but from this group, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So Peter, James, and John are now over here with Jesus in this group. Now I've got four witness accounts. I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I just told you that John is over here, away from this group. So what does that mean? Write this down because it's important. Not only is it good for investigation, investigative purposes, but it's actually great for anyone that has a relationship with Jesus. Proximity determines reliability. Your proximity to Jesus determines your reliability in him. Certainly as a witness statement, if I'm an investigating officer, one of the first things I'm going to ask anybody, if they're walking around, they tell me what happens, I got a witness here and a witness here and a witness here, first thing I'm going to ask them, where were you when this happened? 
And if two of the witnesses don't have a good vantage point, but one of the witnesses does, guess what that does to his testimony, regardless of his education level, regardless of who he is, his relationship. If he has a better vantage point than anyone else, it immediately elevates his testimony, his statement above everyone else's because of what he saw. And as I'm investigating this and I'm looking at this, John has a vantage point that the other three Gospels don't have. John has something that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not have. So I had to look at these two. Something in John's Gospel is available to me as an investigator that the other ones don't. The other ones don't put this forward. And so I started studying three... The three of the four, the three of the, the other three of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I started studying their accounts. I elevated John's, but I put his over here because I wanted to see what Matthew, Mark, and Luke told me. And I, as I studied Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them told me that the arrest of Jesus, this this encounter that Jesus had with this group that was going to arrest him, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell me it went down like this. And you can look it up for yourself. Matthew 26, uh, Mark 14, Luke 22. Of the three, Matthew's the most descriptive, so I'm going to go ahead and utilize his explanation of it, but all three of them say the same thing. But Matthew chapter 26, verse 47, starting the second half of it, says, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. Okay, so now Judas is back. And with him was a large crowd, and they're armed with swords, clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Okay, so first thing, they're armed, and they have authority. And by all looks of it, by all accounts, this group outnumbers the other group. This is not a good position to be in. When you have 30 to 40 people coming your way, coming with bad intentions, one of the things we would, when we would investigate th uh, what we call a threat assessment, there's three things we would, look, we would look at. Number one was do they have the ability, do they have the opportunity, and do they have the intent? Well, all three are satisfied, which makes this a threat. They have the ability they have clubs and they have swords. They have the opportunity because they're in proximity and they have the intent. Why? Because they have swords and because they have clubs and they're coming their way towards Jesus. All three elements of a threat assessment are satisfied. This is a threat and Matthew paints this picture. Verse 48, he says, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. He says, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. This mob didn't know Jesus. They didn't care to know Jesus. They were just here to do some sketchy stuff. And Judas told him, this is the guy, the one that I, that, that, that I walk up to and give a kiss to. Now, that wasn't a sign of romance. That was a sign of honor. That was a way that they would show respect to their rabbi back then. And so how, how, how ironic is this, is that Judas is walking up and he's showing a sign of honor while simultaneously cutting Jesus' legs out from under, under him, theoretically. It's, the ultimate, it's, it, it, it's just this ultimate picture of an ugly double cross. Verse 49 Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Okay. I hear that. I hear that account. And Mark and Luke tell a very similar account. I hear that account. But here's the problem I have with it. They had one vantage point. But there's one witness that had a different vantage point. A closer vantage point because Jesus said come here while they stay there and he took Peter James and John because John had a different vantage point I want to see what he said I want to see what he saw and the more I studied it the more I realized you need to see what he saw because Jesus doesn't call 911 and you're about to find out why and the reason that Jesus doesn't call 911 is the same reason that you shouldn't call on whatever you call on when your peace gets disrupted. I want you to see something here. All the things that we call to give us peace, they don't, they sometimes can give us relief, but they don't give us peace. And the reason they don't give us peace is because they don't have the power that Jesus does to give peace. Because look how John spells this out. John chapter 18, verse 3. John says, So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing what was about to happen to him, what does that mean? 
It means that Jesus is ahead of you. Jesus is before you. The thing that you're encountering, Jesus already knows what's coming. He's seen it. He's dealt with it. He's familiar with it. He's not caught off guard by it. Because as you walk in your life, Jesus, you need to picture this. Not only is he beside you and within you, he's before you. He's gone where you're walking into. It says Jesus, knowing what was going to happen to him, remember, he knows what's going to happen to you even when you don't, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Now, wait a minute. He went out and asked them. I thought the other three said that the mob approached him. But John, who has a better vantage point than the other three disciples, says no. Jesus went out and approached them. Jesus was not the receiver of this conversation. He was the initiator of this conversation. Jesus was, I mean, picture this. You got 30 to 40 armed men, a mob coming at you with authority. And Jesus isn't going, oh, guys, this is uncomfortable. He walks right up to them. Jesus goes face to face with the mob. This mob got to see, because you got to understand how, 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 how the four gospels write. Matthew writes to show the kingship of Jesus. Mark writes to show the, the, this, the, the man, Jesus as a man. Luke writes to show Jesus as a servant. But John, he writes to show Jesus as the son of God. And this mob was walking face to face. They were going to see the face, the face of the son of God. Jesus is not backing down from this at all. He's actually initiating and walking toward it. And when Jesus asked them, who is it you want? The crowd responded, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And the response Jesus gives, in your Bible, if you open it up, it will say that Jesus said, I am he. But I'm not a Greek student. I want to be one, and I really wanted to be one this week. Because there's something in the Greek text that is not in your Bible. If you study the phrase, I am he, in this text, in the original Greek, you will find that the word he is in brackets. What does that mean? That means Jesus did not say, I am he. Jesus said, I am. Why is that important? Because when Moses, way back in Exodus, asked God, when people say, who sent me? Who should I tell them sent me? When he's having a face-to-face -face conversation with God, you know what God said? Who should I tell them sent me? What's your name? God said, I am. This mob walks up to Jesus, and Jesus showed this mob very quickly. You're not messing with just a mere man. You're messing with the Son of God. That's who you're messing with. And I love what it says after this, because it says, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He said, I am he, but we know that he is in brackets. So Jesus says, I am. And I love that it says this in parentheses. It says, and Judas the traitor was standing there. I love that it says, it amuses me that it says was standing because of verse 6. Verse 6 says, when Jesus said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. I had to know how they fell. Did they take a knee? Did they fall forward to worship him? Did they get knocked on their tail? How did they fall? And I, I went as Greek as I could. I am in the original language. I'm diving in. I did everything that I could. And you know what I discovered? You know what I found out? This word is only used like, it's only used like five different times. And they're all in Revelation. The, these men fell in such a way, they were standing, and before they knew it, they were on their backside, completely dumbfounded, completely stunned. They got knocked over. In other words, power went out from Jesus. Jesus looked at them and said, I am. The whole mob went down like bowling pins. The whole mob went down like bowling pins. And then I love what he says. I mean, Jesus knocks them on their tails so fast and while they're picking them up, they're picking themselves off the ground. Verse 7 says, again, he asked them, who is it you want? Man, that is savage. These guys got knocked down and Jesus is still going, tell me again who you want. Who is, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm kind of reading into it at this point, but the way I hear it, Jesus knocks these guys down and goes, come on, you want some more? Tell me again. Say it again. Who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I love this. I love what he says. Because as they're standing to their feet, he says, I told you, I told you, that's who I am. If you're looking for me, and he points to the people behind him, he says, let them go, let them go. 
why did I, again, this wasn't where I was going to go this Easter. It wasn't at all. And as I was praying to God, trying to figure out, why did you, why, why, why are we talking about this? I mean, we are talking about the resurrection. Why are we talking about this? Why I mean, every church I know of in America is probably talking about the resurrection story. Why am I sitting here talking about this encounter that Jesus had hours before ultimately he was put on the cross and crucified? And it was that phrase I just said. It was like the Lord said, say that to me again. He was put on the cross and crucified. No, he wasn't. Jesus was not led to the cross by any man or by any crooked government for that matter. Jesus wasn't led to the cross. Jesus laid down on the cross. They didn't come and capture Jesus. You understand that? They didn't come and capture Jesus. He chose to die. The better question we should be asking this Easter, why in the world would Jesus choose to die? Why would he choose to die? That makes no sense. Why would he do that? Well, the original text I was going to preach from was Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Because when this all happens, one of his disciples says, no, I don't want this to happen, pulls out his sword and takes his wild swing and ends up cutting some dude's ear off. And Jesus starts scolding the guy going, whoa, 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 we don't need this. We don't need this. I, I single-handedly just knocked this entire mob down. And if I really wanted to, in Matthew 26, verse 53, he says, I could call down he says, more than 12 legions of angels. And that bothered me because Jesus didn't mince words. Why did you say more than 12? You could have illustrated the point by just saying, I, I could call down a legion. You know how much a legion is? It's 6,000 angels. Jesus could have easily made the point by saying a legion, but he didn't. He said, I can call down more than, more than 12,000 legions of angels, or more than 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels. And I got fixated on it with it being the beginning, day one of our 12th year of ministry, I got fixated on it. I couldn't figure out. I said, why, did, why in the world did you say more than 12? And as I started to ask that question, and as I started to wonder that question, the more I dove into that one, it was like, hey, wrong question. The question you need to be asking is not why did he say what he said? The question you need to be asking is why did he choose to die? And the answer is, Instead of choosing thousands of angels, Jesus Christ chose thousands of generations. Instead of choosing thousands of angels, Jesus chose thousands of generations to be redeemed via his sinless life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He chose you. He could have chosen the angels, he could have chosen the relief, but he didn't. He chose you. And he chose your family. He chose those you love. He chose those who are close to you. Why did he choose you? Because he is for you. He is 100% for you. Even if you have never been for him, he has always been for you. While there is still breath in your lungs, he has been for you. His life in exchange for your sin. Why would he do that? Because he loves you. And while you're still breathing, he does not want to lose you. And your future was worth more to him than his preferences. If you look in Matthew chapter 18, I'm sorry, John, I'm sorry. Yeah, John chapter 18, we left off in verse 8. But there's something else I want us to see, because if you look at the very next verse in verse 9, when Jesus said, let make sure that you let these people go, he said, this happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one that you gave to me. Well, where did he say that? He said that in John earlier in John chapter 6. And if you look in John chapter 6, Jesus said what his life was all about. Because in verse 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, not to do what I want, not to choose thousands of angels, mm -mm, but to do the will of him who sent me. I'm choosing thousands of generations. But this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. God's will is to bless you. God's will is to keep you with him. Our sin separated us from God. God's will is to keep you with him for all eternity. And he made a way for that to happen via his son, Jesus Christ. 
For the will of my Father, verse 40, is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will rise them up. Just the way that he was risen at the resurrection, Jesus says, I'll rise them up the last day. That's why Jesus surrendered. That's why he laid his life down on the cross. Not because they captured him, because he chose you. He chose to give you peace. But as John chapter 14, verse 27, it says, peace I leave with you. As he was getting ready to die and ascend back to heaven, he said, peace I leave with you. But the peace that I give you, I do not give it to you as the world gives. His peace is more powerful than anything that the world can give you. Any relief that the world can give you, his peace is way more powerful. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Verse 28, you heard me say I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, why did he say this? And why is this here for our benefit? So that when it does happen, you will do the only thing that we need to do to be reconciled to Jesus Christ, or to be reconciled to our Father via Jesus Christ. And that is belief. If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Jesus Christ, a life in Jesus Christ, a new life in Jesus Christ is the ultimate blessing that any, anyone can receive. And I wanna pray one over you now. Heavenly Father, Everywhere I messed up, please make up the difference. Father, I thank you for showing us this Easter that Jesus is not this, this, this accessory, that this isn't a holiday that we celebrate. There's nothing wrong with letting kids go run around and get Easter eggs, that's fine. But this holiday isn't about a stinking bunny. This holiday is about the reconciliation that you have provided via your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that every single person who hears this message inside knows that they're blessed, knows that they are loved beyond measure. The greatest act of love is someone who's willing to give their life for someone else. And your son did that for me, for whoever's listening, to our families, to the generations that will follow. That's how powerful, how amazing Jesus Christ is. I pray that you beckon people into a relationship with you through the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Again, Father, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.